chapter 1, I think it will be right there, and we're going to go all the way to verse 17. So what I'd like us to do is to pray it, and uh, to pray the word of God is just simple. We read it together, and we turn it into a prayer. So can we all do that together? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, all the way to 17. So let's start. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am, I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Pass. Pass. Let's lift up our hands and read the next verse. Now to, to the, the King, King eternal, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So the, this, I want to thank you again for inviting me to uh, share with you at this time of the year when we are usually motivated to appear to be happy. Um, and, uh, uh, thank God for at least that reminder. But for those of us who actually have come to receive the grace that is in Christ, you don't need any reminders other than the fact that He actually dwells in us through His Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy, right? Joy is yes. the very fruit of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, what I want to I always say meditate, because if I were to preach or teach, you'd be here for two hours. So I always say just a little bit of sharing, a meditation, and that's what it should be. Uh, because I have uh, the understanding that you do have studies, you do break into groups and actually go into in-depth studies. So this morning is just to uh, remind us to continue to practice and dwell within the joy that has been given to us through the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It is our benefit in the, in the Messiah. Um, so we already prayed, so I don't want you to say, he didn't pray before speaking, we've prayed. You prayed with me, we prayed to the Lord. And we prayed um, in the room just uh, behind. Is that open to everybody, that time of prayer? Okay, so can I just encourage every one of you, come here with a lot of intention. So when you come, Come early so that if you want to grab a drink, coffee, tea, or the rest, but then you're able to go into that prayer room and pray with everybody. If you were not there this morning, I cannot tell you what transpired, but I would like to encourage you to do that. So may the Lord bless you as you do that. By definition, joy is an emotion evoked by well-being, success, good fortune, or by the process of possessing what one desires. That's the Merriam Webster. That doesn't touch my heart. I know a lot of it, so <laughs> I know myself. That's, if I were to write an essay and quote an authority, I would use that. That has nothing to do with a logic. Let me give you the one that makes sense to me. The definition that captures more closely my heart's understanding is one by C.S. Lewis, and it says, joy, that sharp. Wonderful stab of longing has a life, muscular lightness to it. It's deft. It produces longing that weighs heavy on the heart. But it does so with precision and coordination. It dashes in with the agility of a hummingbird, claiming its nectar from the flower, and then zips away. It pricks, then vanishes, leaving a wake of mystery and longing behind it. Then he goes on to say, Joy in my sense has indeed one characteristic, and one only, in common with them, the fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. I doubt whether anyone has tasted, I doubt whether anyone who has tasted it would ever, if both were in his power, exchange it for all the pleasure in the world. Then, joy is never in our power but pleasure always is. I say that because um, this period 
when I see the hustle and bustle and I see how people are stressed and just um, actually depressed, sometimes lonely, I'm wondering if the gift that was given to mankind that for the shepherd, we already read my passage, were filled with great joy. They were not stressed. They were afraid when they saw the angels because you will be afraid if you saw an angel. But the angel said, I've come to give you good tidings, good news. That is what we call gospel, good news. What would be for all people. And they hurried in haste. They left everything to see what they were being told. So I want to encourage every one of us. This is not something to ask God for because he has already bestowed it upon us. I am praying that the Lord will help you to allow him to remove from your life the distractions, the stones that have blocked the well of joy. That is my prayer. I'm not asking the Lord to fill us with joy. That's his desire. I'm praying to the Lord for me, for you, that we will be patient enough for him to excavate from our hearts dullness, numbness, distractions, inability to focus on the glory and the benefits of Christ. Do you agree with that kind of prayer? Amen. It's not too harsh? No. Okay. All right. You're smiling. I like Amen. that. I can tell you where I'm going to end. Uh, once I was watching um, a clip of the good friends of Martin Luther King Jr. Among them was Dorothy Cotton, the city Vivian, Ralph Abernathy, um, Andrew Young, and they were saying, tell us about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. This was a decade after he passed away. And they talked about many things. And then they said, what about, how did he prepare for his sermons? And they said, MLK always said this, I start from where I'm going to land. I always start from where I intend to end. And that is why you always remember the conclusions of most of his speeches. Because that he worked on it, he wanted you to walk away with a sense of what he really, in essence, was trying to say. So those who listened to his last speech would have heard him say, I'm not afraid of anything. I have been to the mountain top and God has allowed me to see the promised land. We all know it. That's where he wanted to land. Or oh, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty. I'm free at last, you know that. That's where he wanted to land. So, where do I want to land? It's in Philippians chapter 4. You can all open, and I'm told there are Bibles here. But I always say it's unnecessary, unless you're a visitor, if this is your first time coming here, every one of you should have a Bible. You should have it on your smartphone, you should have a copy of the Bible. So, just let me reiterate for, I think Brother Ward may have told you this, you cannot enter a place of worship like this without your Bible or a hymn book on access to them. Is that okay by you? Amen. Yes, you should you should never say I don't have a Bible with me if you're already a believer. If you're a visitor, we have some that you can borrow. So and those of you who have smartphones, open to your Bible. <laughs> Philippians chapter four. I was gonna have some readers. Uh, you read for me please? Do you yeah, yeah why not? Yes, you are right here, my friend, yes. We just won the rugby championship. So you're gonna read for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, is there a way for him to have amplification that he can just read out? Thank you. Yes, you're going to read for me Philippians chapter 4, from verse 4 all the way to verse 7. So let's hear, this is where I want to conclude. You want to pass it to your brother? No, you're reading. No, you, you, no, you, my brother. Yes, right here. You. <laughs> I, you, you just won the championship, right? Okay. That's you I was talking to. Yeah. Philippians chapter 4 from verse 4. Where is Wes? Are you at the... Oh, okay. You can, can you read for me? At some point. Okay, stay there. Stay right there. I'll call upon you. From verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord uh, always. 
Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Oh. Verse 7. Verse 7, again. Uh, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay. So the Apostle Paul is writing to the Philippians, and he's writing from a prison cell. He is inside, they are outside. The man who is in prison is saying to those who are on the outside and free, rejoice in the Lord. And just in case you did not hear it, I will say it again, rejoice. Can you command people to rejoice? Can I say to Janice, rejoice? And she will go ahead and do it. Can I ask Brother Ward, rejoice? Well, here, look at the Word of God. Rejoice in the Lord at what, how many times? Yeah, come on, and don't, it's too early to sleep on me. Rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. Always. Rejoice in the Lord, always. Just in case you did not hear it, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness or the sense of expectancy that you have, knowing the Lord is coming again, for because the word of God tells us our citizenship is in heaven. So people should look at us and say, these people, what are they waiting for? I joined the Boston Red Sox as a fan in 2002 because they never won for 80 something years. I just was tired of the arrogance I was hearing from the Yankees. So I said, I'll pick this team that doesn't win. In 2004, they won the World Series. I was at Fenway Park. Wow. Not for the game, uh, during the time of the parade. <laughs> I went there to see the place. And I saw a city that was joyous. For 86 years, they were expecting a championship. Same thing. When people come to us, they should see the way we live, the way we carry ourselves. These people are expecting something. Amen. That's what's called Advent. Advent is to wait for. You can't wait for the birth of the Lord. He's been born. If you were thinking that's what Advent meant, you're wrong. <laughs> you can't wait for what has already happened. And let me tell you, Jesus doesn't need a birthday celebration. You know, we fake it and say, oh, that's going to be the birthday of Jesus. We need to really make it up so that he's happy. Jesus has been happy and joyful all along. He existed before anything was created but he would like us to look forward to his coming. Amen. So Advent was actually supposed to prepare the disciples of the Lord for his return. Amen. And in his return, he is coming mm -hmm. to restore all things. So people should look at us, our children, rather than on the day of the 25th of December, they want to go check something under the tree. Mm -hmm. They should say, my parents, seem to be expecting something. They're expecting something like I eagerly out, you know, want to go to the tree and look for what's there for me. That's what Advent was supposed to be. It wasn't until later on that Advent was tailored towards Christmas. Actually, Advent, during the time of the early believers, was a time of fasting, and preparation, like what we would call Lent now. It was supposed to help believers remember what is coming. So this period, you can pray all you want for joy. If you don't align yourself with God's priorities, nothing is coming. Amen. You will pray and there will be nothing. Because God cannot condition himself to your misperception. He cannot. You have to align yourself to God's truth. Amen. Yes, ask, you'll be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened. But if you knock on the wrong, wrong door, you will, go into, you, will you go into a place that they will be looking for you. There will be an amber alert. <laughs> <laughs> so better make sure you are knocking at the right door.
Okay, so, um, and at the end, we are going to go through a very uh, monumental hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We're going to go through the four stanzas that I pulled out, and I'm going to um, read some scriptures to back up some of those stanzas. And at the end of every scripture reading, you are going to give me the chorus. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. We will sing that song. We'll get there. So first I want to quickly look at the passage we were reading. Let's go back to John, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Give it to West. It's West's time to read. Luke, chapter 1. And we're going to get it from verse 14. I won't, have all, I won't have the opportunity to read the context, but I will want you to read the whole of that um, transaction. Between the angel that came to Zechariah during the time of offering and all the way to um, what he had to say. But Wes, if you could please begin at verse 14. That would be, actually you can start from verse 12. And read all the way to verse 17. Thank you, Wes. Go ahead. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and to the disobedient, to the wisdom and the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Thank you. So to Zechariah, who has never had a child. After these many years, he's probably resigned himself to living that way. I'm sure they were comfortable. Um, you know, the word of God describes them as devout and complete. They were righteous. They were people who walked in all the ways of the Lord. All of a sudden, he's hearing this. You're going to have a son. Um, your wife is going to have a baby, a son. Can you hear me? Okay. And he said, um, this is what he said, he will, this, look, verse 14, look at your word, look at the word of God, look at me, check it, check it. He will be a joy and delight to you. Most of us parents understand that, but the angel is saying to Zechariah, this boy will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. You remember what we said about joy? You remember that fluttering? Like a hummingbird is, you know, picked up the nectar? Mm -hmm. That lightness. You know, if you have been baptized with joy, you'll know what I'm talking about. I know. Joy has actually been the underlying um, background music to my life within the landscape of grace. He said, this boy will give you a lot of joy and delight. But not only that, many will rejoice at his birth. What is John's goal? He is not bringing the Super Bowl to the Buffalo Bills. That's not his job. What is, what is it that he's going to do and that will bring so much joy? Look at that. He will bring back, verse 16, Many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, he will return them to God, who himself is the source of joy. You know, remember Psalm 16? Mm -hmm. I thy presence, there is at the right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That's what was quoted to, during the day of Pentecost to prove resurrection. The Lord is always before me. I will rejoice. I will not be afraid because you will not suffer your holy one to see corruption. That's how they prove the resurrection. He said he will return the people back to their God. And every time you read in the 
in the history of the children of Israel, whenever they had strayed and then the prophet brought them to God, they saw always rejoicing. Think of the time of Nehemiah, after the people remember their disobedience, their exile, and now returning to God to build the walls of Jerusalem, the Bible said there was great joy. And the prophet said to them, Nehemiah is a prophet, whether you like it or not. He said, rejoice, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Rejoice, the joy of the Lord is your strength. How am I going to get through this? The joy of the Lord. There is joy that comes from other things. Yes, uh, you know, like I said, um, in the city of Boston, there was a joy that came from within the, um, you know, passing the other body. But there's a joy that is superior to all, that you are here to. There are some of you here who may not have really come to an understanding of what we mean by a relationship with the Creator God, the one who made all things, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is actually not too far-fetched. It's not too far from you. Because that same Lord that was born many years ago to die so that we might come to God is here. Amen. And you can actually come, you, right, you don't have to wait until I'm done. You can say, Lord Jesus, I really need you to show, show up. Overcome my doubt, my ignorance, my darkness and my sin. Break through and grant me salvation. Grant me joy. Grant me light. Pull me out of myself. Out of the darkness around me. Out of Satan's kingdom. And bring me into your glorious light. You can do that. That's how I, became, that's how I came to the Lord. I was watching people. And all I said in my heart, God, could you please change me? Nobody heard me. There was no altar call. I just saw young people joyful singing. I was 16. And I said, Lord, could you change me? I didn't tell my brother. I didn't tell anybody. That week, and it was August 6, 1978. That week on Wednesday, somebody came to my house. He shared with me Galatians chapter 5. And that's how I came to understand the rudiments of the gospel. So that's all we can do. We can respond to God. But let me go on. He would go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Put, look at that. Hold on. Come with me. He would bring the people back to God. But there's something else he's going to do. And we, we better take this. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. You remember what Elijah is known for? He brought the people back to God. He showed the prophets of Baal to be nothing but empty barrels. He is one of the greatest comedians in the Bible. He said, um, hmm, uh, there you go. You better go check because he may have fallen asleep and this set up his alarm. <laughs> Where is your God? What? He's not hearing you? Go, 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 try, try. He may have gone on a trip. You have a cell number? Call him. <laughs> you have to read the Bible with the humor intended. Come on, God is the most humorous. You read the word of God? God is funny. Beyond the scripture. You see how he mocks idols? He says somebody goes to buy, you know, goes to the goes to the forest. He cuts a piece of wood. He uses it to bake. He warms himself. And all of a sudden, he takes from that same tree. He casts an idol. He says, oh my God. Is that not ridiculous? <laughs> you can read the word of God in the right way. Jesus is very funny. Amen. <laughs> Jesus is very funny. He waits until everybody's running, you know, at the wedding. And he said, eh, go pour water into it. He could have just said, let wine come. He said, go, go, you know, where's your water? Pour it in and go give it to people today. Read it in that way. You will be amazed. One of the things that A.W. Tozer taught me, he said, God is easy to live with. I had to try it for myself. Jesus is amazing. Those of us who know him, Jesus understands us. He comes to us 
And he says, so what were you people talking about? He knew what they were talking about on the way to admire. Say, ah, so uh, he said, are you the only stranger here? He said, what things? Uh, uh, yeah, no, like what? <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. To make a people prepared for the Lord. Let me show you another person. Go down further in verse 44 of that same chapter. How many children are here? Right here. How many children? Aiden, where are you? Okay. How many are there? Let me, let me read to you. You know, sometimes we teach children as if they can't understand the Holy Spirit. Watch. Yeah. There we go. Verse 44. I'm still a child. So it says, <laughs> At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. When he got there, and uh, as soon as she, in a loud voice, that's Elizabeth, who's older than Mary. She's already about six months pregnant. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. Are you hearing me? Look at that. And then she said in a loud voice, Blessed are you among women. Blessed the child you bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached me, my ears, no, came to my ears. Your greeting came to my ears. The baby in my womb lived for what? Joy. Joy. What? Joy. Joy. <coughs> you <are a> baby. <laughs> you think sometimes we're talking to children and we want to bring them kindergarten spirituality. It doesn't work that way. You have to tell children everything. Let them know what you know. You say they don't understand. Their spirits understand. You were thinking of their understanding. Some of you don't understand. Some of you read, you've been to college, you have PhDs, and some of you still read the Bible wrong. Because it is not physically understood. The Bible is the only book that if you read it right, the author is writing you. In your, it lives with you. You can always say, Holy Spirit, I don't understand that. What, what were we intending to say? People want to go to commentary first. I love commentaries. I like reading other people's, whatever they say. My best way to study the Word of God is to say, Holy Spirit, what did you mean by this? Amen. What were you intending to reveal to us? Because it's right there. I read Shakespeare. Shakespeare has been long dead. I can never ask him, Will, you know, Bill, what were you intending to say here? He can't correct it. But I have the Holy Spirit right within me who can bring the Word of God. One of the times I was trying to understand why did Samuel become a high priest? And I asked the Holy Spirit. I wonder if the Holy Spirit said, you remember that every firstborn was supposed to be dedicated to God? I said, yeah. But you remember that the Levites were taken to represent them. But in this case, Hannah refused that exchange. So Samuel could become a high priest, even though he was not from the tribe of Levi. I said, my goodness. I didn't have to go to a commentary for that. That is the Holy Spirit. He wrote it. He knows what he's talking about. The word of God is alive. It's alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on. So, next person. Let's go to the aged, uh, uh, go to the next <coughs> chapter. How am I doing for time? When is time minutes do this for me? How many more minutes I got? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do this for me. How many, how many more minutes do I have? Mm -hmm. If you say that, that's dangerous. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's go to chapter 2. We're, only go we're not going too far. We'll stay in this chapter 2. Luke 2. Luke chapter 2. Let's go to a man, Simeon. So this is the time they brought the baby, uh, the Lord Jesus, to perform what the Lord had um, put as a, it, the Lord had you know, indicated this in the Torah. And so, moved by the Spirit, verse 27, that this is Simeon, uh, who in verse 26, we are told it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the lost Messiah. Mm. Now you have to remember that God <laughs> promised and how God said, you will be a kingdom of priests to me. You will be my special possession. But they also know of how their disobedience took them out of that land. And God brought prophets to, re to remind them to come back to God. 
They all know. And this time, they are living under the occupation of a heathen nation. They are living under the occupation of a people that have no regard for the laws of their God. So every day, they are aware of that sacrilege. They are looking for the time when the Lord will bring his Messiah. And if you take some time, brethren, to read Isaiah, in chapter 11, it talks about the root of, you know, David, the stem of Jesse, the brat of Jesse, who will bring in a kingdom that will do away with all injustice. A kingdom where there will be no fighting. The lion will become a vegetarian. <laughs> And in chapter 2, earlier on, he said, all the nations will say, let us go to Zion. Let's hear the teaching of the Lord. And he said, nations will learn to make wars no more. Let me give you, imagine this with me. When you read those things, sometimes you have to put some statistics. Do you know how much this nation spends on one missile? Do you know what one nuclear missile cost us? Any of, uh, uh, where is Brother Elijah? Brother Elijah. Well, it's not here. Any of you, and what, why much do we spend on defense annually in this nation? How much? You don't know. Go find out. Billions. It will take care of all the things that we need money for education. Our teachers will not have to buy pencils for their children. But the reason we have to do that is fear. That another nation may attack us. So we, that fear, that paranoia, and how the greater you are as a nation, the greater your fear. There's, it's, look, if we were Christians, the Lord will fight our battles. But I won't go there today. Amen. The reason we are there is because we are afraid. So when people say we are the strongest nation on earth, you should be terrified because of what we did in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. That we can do that again, or that others can do it to us. But the cost is enormous. In chapter 2 of Isaiah, it says, Nations will learn to make war no more. Amen. Yes, eh? That is what they are looking for. A time when you, wouldn't you like to be, Brother Watson, you're closer to me, wouldn't you have better like to be in a place where you never have to apologize to each other? There is no offense, there is no misunderstanding. You can't just. Let me, this is my wife is here. Let's just picture every day we have no misunderstanding. We're kind. There's nothing. We don't have to settle any quarrel. Think of your workplace. Nobody has to put you down. Everybody is living with understanding. Now the time the Beatles and the hippies were, you know, um, trying to project. But this will really happen. So th these are the things that people were looking for. And you know the word used? The consolation of Israel. So it says Simeon was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the time when the Lord will bring all his promises to fulfillment. And the Lord said to him, you will not die until you see the beginning of that fulfillment. So he came into the temple. Nobody said, you know, Demetrius, verse 28. Simeon took him in his hand, in his arms, and praised the Lord. Amen. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now say, I can go now. I can die. And I can die for, I'm, 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 I've seen it. Dropping the mic. <laughs> Simeon, you just drop the mic. It's time. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all what? Check the word of God. All nations. Not just Israel. A light of revelation to the Gentiles, we the nations that are not Israel, and the glory, the prestige of your people Israel. That's what Simon was looking for. Simeon was looking for that. So, um, I will, the wise men, I, I'm going to, you know, just quickly run through that. I don't have to make you open up, but if you go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, the wise men, the righteous men that came or princes from the east, we don't know who they were, but I know they were black people. Um, yeah, 
Um, they came, they said, where is it that is born king of the Jews? Now, why would somebody from another nation want to know a king of another nation? Unless there is something bound up with that. If this king is going to be the king to bring justice to all the nations, and he will be, but he will be called the king of Israel, reign of the royal house of David, these men must have had a revelation that there is one born who is finally going to rule over all and bring justice. It's like somebody who has read the charter of the United Nations. But remember that there's somebody actually who can make it work. Everything the world is preparing for is a weak imitation of what really will be. The desires of the nations to come together and abolish war and strife is a weak imitation of what God has put in place. That's what we're looking for. So as much as children are going to look for their gift on Wednesday, they should see in our lives a longing. So Robin, in your household, you have children, right? Not yet. Okay, you, but you will have children at some point. Okay, be prepared for it now. So be prepared. They say, what you should do? <laughs> be prepared for it. How your children, when they come, will see you with the joy of expectation. And say, why are you, why, why, what's wrong with you guys? What's, what's going on? Tell me the secret. Somebody has come in. At some point, he already came. That's why we're doing this, to let us know he's come, but he also lets us know he's coming again. When he comes, what's he going to do? What's he going to bring for me? You sit the child down and tell them the truth. There's no Santa Claus coming from the chimney. You know, he might block my chimney, so nobody be Santa Claus doesn't even know my address. I blocked the chimney a long time ago. <laughs> because I got a better one. <clears throat> so let's go on. I'm going to skip to the calling to joy. What the Lord has accomplished for us, he reconciled us to God and has made us join heads with his father. For his fa of his father, we are joined heads. The Bible says, because we are children, God has put the spirit of his son into our hearts to declare, to call Abba, Father. And I probably may have spoken to you before that I don't buy the argument of people saying, because I never had a good earthly father, I can't relate to God as father. No. That argument is null and void. It's true. I don't need my he earthly father to be able to relate to my heavenly father. What God has done for me as a father, my father could never have done it even if he was the best of fathers. And my father's inadequacies do not make it difficult for me to know the Lord as my father. He put his spirit in me to make me accept him as my father. I have no problems calling God father. So if anybody, any psychoanalyst telling you the reason that you cannot relate to God as father is because of your earthly father, I said, that's not correct. <laughs> I don't believe that. I never will. The Lord said in the word of God, when he came into the world, the world he made did not accept him. But to those who did, he gave them the ability, the authority, the furnishing to be called children of God. Amen. Is to be fortified with the ability to know God as your father. Don't sell yourself short. You know, it's, you know sometimes when you want to have self-pity and just say, you know, the, nobody knows the troubles I face, it's good to say such things. But don't look at your earthly father. There is no comparison. Amen. I, no, are you hearing me? There is no comparison. You can fully accept all the benefits of being a child of God, whatever your father did or did not do. And I have problems with my father, so that's, I'm not unmindful of what some of you, you know, have faced. But let's put that aside. Joy is caused by a realization of our internal inheritance. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read it. I don't have time to ask somebody to read it, but I want this, I must read. 1 Peter chapter 1, so the Apostle Peter, who knew his time was coming up, wanted to remind believers of what faith in the Lord is. So he wrote uh, um, this epistle, and he calls it to the God's elect, verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1. 
scattered through the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, all of that, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ, sprinkled with his blood. Verse 3, Pray, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given new birth to us through, you know, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Amen. 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 Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. You greatly rejoice. Why? Though for now, a little while, you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. This is our calling. We are called into joy. Not to look for what God has done for us, but what is to come. We have an inheritance that is reserved for us. It cannot perish. It does not fade. And it's not pie in the sky. This is real. Because it's not a lot of time, i like our brother to put up um, one of the great hymns that we sing at this time. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Yes. And it is not for Christmas. This is oh, come, and come again. The coming, the next coming. So you're going to stand up with me. In a little while, yeah, just now. And we're going to have, I'm going to read the stanzas. When I finish, you're going to sing the chorus. You remember the chorus? Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Let's no, try, let's try, let's try. One to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. and rescue captive Israel. <coughs> when we say Israel, you say, but I'm not an Israelite. Oh, you didn't read the Bible right. In Ephesians, it says you have now become part of the commonwealth of Israel. And you, all the promises of the prophets and the Lord Jesus Christ, you inherit all of that. Are you not a child of Abraham? By faith, yeah. you are. Woo! Amen. Okay, so this part is for you. We must lowly exile here. Yes, we are sojourners. We are in exile until the Son of God draws near. What is the chorus? Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. Let's have the second stanza. O come, true wisdom from on high. Who orders all to mind and eye. To us the path of knowledge show. And teach us in her ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you. Come, strong key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Upon our journey, give relief and close the path to pain and grief. Before you sing, rejoice. In Isaiah 22, 22, it says, And the key of the house of David will, will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none can shut. And he shall shut and none can open. In chapter 1 of Luke, verse 32, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give him the throne of his father David. Rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. Finally, let's look at the next one. <coughs> It says, King of nations, oh come, 
embrace and unify the human race. Command our sad division cease. And he for all the Prince of Peace. What do we say? Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. One more time. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Remember, Stanley, while I read this and then we'll close in prayer. <coughs> Hopefully, we too can declare with sense of old, undeniably, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in flesh, was justified in spirit, was sent by messengers or angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. That's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let me allow this period for you to reflect and to just take an armchair and dwell within the joy of the Lord. <laughs>